forward to the cloud. On my computer, it is 10 o'clock, which means it is seven o'clock in y'all's time. Uh, good evening and welcome to Know Before You Grow, a committee of Petaluma Urban Chat. I'm Dan Like, a very tired and sleep deprived Dan Like, uh, coming to you from Maumee, Ohio this evening, uh, but I'll try to keep it together. Uh, as always, extreme thanks to Dave Alden and uh, Sharon Kirk for putting the meetings together. And let me admit all the people who just joined. Uh, so a few notes before we start. Um, we have a couple of meetings coming up. October 28th at noon, we're going to get together at Aquas to chat about, uh, well, we don't have an agenda for that, but if you're interested in being a part of planning for things, uh, please come to that. On um, the, the session later this week or later this month got canceled, which means I can go to another meeting that evening. Uh, but early on in November, we have a likely forum for affordable housing coming up. December 15th, we'll have a forum on urban growth boundaries. And we're working with uh, the bike coordinator from Davis for an early 2022 date. Please sign up for the mailing list and the regular updates that Dave does, which are amazing at urbanchat.org. Uh, also, a number of us, based on the, um, the meeting that we had with Doug Farr presenting, decided we wanted to read one of Doug's books. And we looked at what Doug's books cost, and we decided we wanted to read his older book because we could get that used for cheaper. So we are having a reading group for sustainable urbanism, urban design with nature by Doug Farr. If you're interested, there's actually an extra copy floating around in the community um, that I'm currently on the hook to buy from Sharon, but we'll happily pass along to whoever else wants to and get in touch with, uh, with us to help read that. Um, the basic housekeeping notes, we have been Zoom bombed. We will be Zoom bombed before if the screen goes weird, uh, if I will lock the meeting as quickly as I can and try to boot the offenders, um, which leads us to, if you are late in joining and trying to get in, I am going to message you. If you do not answer the messages and your name is something weird that doesn't look like a name I recognize, I'm not going to let you in. If somebody contacts one of us and says, hey, Dan's not letting me in, please tell me about this. Um, we're going back to the, uh, the, the chat format, which goes only directly to me. Um, I find that if I'm monitoring for questions, that's more than enough than trying to have a side channel discussion going. And I learn more and hopefully you all learn more if we give my, our, everything to our presenters. And with that, I would like to turn the evening over to Petaluma CEQA coordinator, Olivia Urban, to talk about VMT and vehicle miles traveled. Olivia, the floor is yours. All right, good evening. I am sharing my screen and assume that is all visible for everyone. Yes, great. Uh, wonderful. Well, good evening. I'm Olivia Urban. I am an environmental planner for the city's planning division. I am pleased to be hosting this evening's event for a discussion on vehicle miles traveled. I want to start by just acknowledging that Urban Chats did an event over the summer titled Transportation Context, which really helped to tell the story about how communities like Petaluma were developed and oriented for the automobile. That forum shared ideas about new urbanism and how principles of design in the built environment help to realize the shift from our cars to uh, from a, a car centric development pattern to a vibrant, walkable, bike friendly community. That discussion included information about the potential for Petaluma to become a bike and pedestrian and transit oriented community because of its location within a uh, an area that is blessed with pleasant climate most of the year. So it encourages and supports folks to get outside and make that healthy outdoor shift. And also we have a relatively compact city. It's about three miles across. So that sets the stage to allow for uh, non-auto trips across the town. So in order to make strides and successfully reduce uh, VMTs citywide, we must address existing VMTs that is those that are here today from the, the past that we come from, as well as BMTs generated by new development. 
So what we're talking about this evening is the regulation that has been adopted that starts to force this change for new development and what the city is currently doing and pursuing to work towards that walkable, bikeable, transit-oriented vision that we all share. So let me start by introducing the rest of our panelists tonight and clicking on this page. So tonight you are going to hear from um, myself as well as the folks you see on the screen here. Matt Goyne is a senior associate with Farron Pierce. He advises on a range of projects at the nexus of land use and transportation planning. Matt has been providing transportation relating consulting services to the city of Petaluma for several years and folks probably recognize him from past uh, events in the city. You'll also hear from Ken uh, Eichstad. He has more than 30 years of civil engineering experience and has been working for the city of Petaluma since 2019. As the city's transportation engineer, he's working to improve the city's roads and pathways for all users and uh, with particular emphasis on the pedestrian and cyclist. And Ken is also the staff liaison to the city's pedestrian and bike advisory committee. Also, we have Jared Hall. Uh, he is the city's transit manager who oversees and directs operations and services of Petaluma Transit Network. He conducts route planning, manages operation contracts, and he coordinates with the regional transit partners. And Jared serves as staff to the Petaluma Transit Advisory Committee. So our primary objective here this evening is really to share information and resources around the state's uh, VMT mandate. I have now used that acronym several times um, and just wanna make sure everybody is aware that that is vehicle miles traveled. I will keep using that acronym VMT uh, throughout the evening. So we um, hope that you'll learn a bit more about the city's process to establish the, the guidelines to come into conformance with uh, the state mandate and what those guidelines are used for and how they, they work. And to hear about what the city is doing to reduce VMTs from those existing uses and to uh, shift to provide alternate travel modes. And then uh, hopefully when we get into the discussion, we'll share ideas about where we go from here and the next steps that are needed to really tip the scale and get us out of our cars increase ridership and uh, see more kids walking to school and biking to school and see community members choose the active transportation and public transit options. So during the first part of our presentation, you're going to hear about the VMT regulation. Um, again, those are imposed on new development and then we'll pivot to talk about what actions the city is taking and pursuing to start to carve away at VMTs. Uh, that again are a product of that car centric development pattern that has been a way of life for decades. So you're going to hear uh, in detail in just a moment about the Senate Bill 743 that prompted the shift from how we look at transportation impacts under the California Environmental Quality Act. You'll gain an understanding of what's required under that legislation uh, to result in quantifiable reductions to VMT versus what is good practice and is uh, supportive rather than what is quantifiable and measurable. And you'll be provided of a, pro of a summary of the process that the city went through to establish the BMT guidelines and the recent action that the council took to get those uh, adopted. And then we'll walk through a couple of project examples to get a flavor of how the BMT guidelines play out in practice. And then you'll hear about some of the municipal activities that the city is pursuing both from an engineering standpoint in terms of how we design our roads like the Petaluma uh, Boulevard Road Diet and our trails like the Lynch Creek Trail, as well as what is happening with public transit uh, currently. So I am going to hand it over now to Matt Boyne to take us on a zero VMT stroll down where this all started. Great. Thanks, Olivia. And thanks, you know, before you grow for having us here today to talk about this. This is, uh, you know, obviously a very important topic. Yeah, I was asked to just give a brief history of how we got here today and why it's taken so long, I suppose, would be one way to frame it. Uh, this, the state's climate journey started with AB 32, which required that it reduced its greenhouse gas emissions, and that was passed back in 2006. So we've been, been on this journey for a while. Um, there was a subsequent uh, legislation that was passed in 2007, SB 97, which required greenhouse gas emissions to be evaluated as part of CEQA. And then SB 35, which required that all jurisdictions, all uh, regions reduce its greenhouse, set targets for and reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. 
SB 743, as Olivia alluded to, was the, the bill that actually required the state to replace level service with vehicle miles traveled. That was passed back in 2013. So it has been a while. It took about five years for the rules to be put in place by the Office of Planning and Research. So that's a state organization that oversees uh, implementation of, of environmental policies. Um, and the secret guidelines were also updated there. And then there was a grace period of a, you know, about a year and a half, two years uh, for jurisdictions to adopt it. And since July 2020, level service cannot, has not been used for environmental purposes, um, only vehicle miles traveled. So, you know, the, one of the insights here is that it did take a while. It takes a while for state agencies to move through these things. And, you know, level of service, as I'll explain a little bit, what it is a little bit more, has been around for 50, 60 years while vehicle miles traveled really hasn't been around for more than five, 10 years now at this point. So what we're seeing is kind of just some of the time it takes to just really engage and work through all the issues. And, you know, we're, we've been, Finding, I'd say there's new issues uh, every every week with vehicle miles traveled that we come across in terms of trying to implement the process. So it's it's still ongoing to say the least. Um, if you go to the next slide, so the just a bit more background. The California Air Resources Board is the agency that sets the targets for the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that we should strive for in the coming years, and then that flows down to individual jurisdictions. Um, the VMT component of it, of course, there's many part, different components of, of getting to carbon neutrality and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The VMT is tailpipe emissions is an important part of that. Um, as you can see, it, it started to decline in the early 2000s as a rate, um, as because honestly, cities were, were booming. A lot of people were moving into cities. And then there was, of course, the 2008 uh, recession that caused it to continue to decline. And then what we end up seeing is that it started to go back up again over the past decade um, as the economy boomed. And so the California Air Resources Board updates this every five years. We're working off those 2015, 2016 targets right now. They were gonna do it in 2020. Obviously that they couldn't do that because the, the everything changed, um, And but they're working on setting new targets again for the state to make sure that we're pursuing our, our long-term climate goals. Um, I think it's supposed to be in 2022 now at this point. So. Just a little bit more background about that, the level service versus vehicle miles traveled. So level service is rated on a scale from A to F. Um, and so here's two examples, uh, same as in school. Uh, level service prioritizes driver. It, it's meant to minimize the delay incurred by drivers. Um, and so that leads to, uh, you know, the patterns of urban form that's shown on the left there. While the form on the right, which I think many of us would consider a great, you know, walkable, vibrant neighborhood, but it has a lot of cars backed up, moving slowly through it is a level service F. And so you can see how, you know, the type when this was our environmental framework, you can see the type of land uses that were encouraged. Um, and when we shift to vehicle miles traveled, um, we, next slide, we start to see, you know, we start to think about an actual metric that really represents an impact on the environment. Um, vehicle miles traveled is simply it's one one car traveling one mile is one vehicle miles traveled four cars traveling 10 miles is 40 vehicle miles traveled. SB 743 as a bill incurred used vehicle miles traveled because if we reduce those we are focusing our development in infill locations versus suburban sprawl. We reduce the amount of greenhouse gas that we're creating because people are driving less amounts of distance into fewer locations. And we also make the, we can focus on making streets safer by reducing the amount of vehicles that are on our roadways. Next slide. When we think about strategies and policies that can be put into place to reduce the, change the way that we travel and reduce vehicle miles traveled, I think of it in this type of how many people are affected by different strategies. So the foundation of, how we travel is really the location of efficiency and, and uh, kind of regional connectivity. Petaluma will never be San Francisco. That's okay. It has a lot of other things that it can do uh, starting the, at the community policy and strategy level, which is where the community is right now in terms of the general plan. It's setting policies that will affect the future. And it affects a lot of people because it will affect both existing and future residents, visitors, employees in Petaluma. Um, and then towards the top, you know, we get slightly less effective, you know, whether it's site design, we're talking about 
good planning, you know, to and through a, a site or on the project frontage or uh, uh, transportation demand management measures, which typically only apply to, you know, it might be um, marketing materials or sometimes transit pass subsidies that only applies to the, the people who live or work at a location. So generally, you know, the least overall impact they're going to make, but definitely an important part of the overall paradigm. So when we start to talk about measures to help reduce vehicle miles traveled, we have a, a guidebook that was first written in 2010 and was updated just in August 2021 with a draft handbook. Um, and this is another state agency um, that's involved here, the California Air Pollution Control Officers Association that led this research. And so what this spells out is a whole range of uh, both transportation, but also land use type met and, and other measures to, to achieve carbon neutrality. And the transportation specific measures both include quantifiable measures, such as some of those listed. Um, you know, you can quantify the benefits of increasing the density or diversity of land uses, implementing car share program, subsidizing transit passes. These are the things that there is robust research demonstrating that you can shift modes and change how people travel. There's also a lot of supportive measures that are listed here. And this is an important dis distinction because these are still great planning measures that should be incorporated. However, there's not the evidence, unfortunately, at this stage to support a, a quantifiable reduction in, in a place like Petaluma. Some of these measures do have evidence, say, for when they're implemented in San Francisco, they might, they, they can be quantified, the benefits can be quantified, but in a suburban location such as Petaluma, sometimes they, there's just no studies um, that actually demonstrate that they, they are effective in that case. So this is important to recognize that for CEQA purposes, we need to, for mitigation, we need to rely on those quantifiable measures, but that's, there's nothing to stop the city from implementing a broad suite of best practices. And so when you start to think, and I'm going to stay general here, and then Olivia will, will go on to uh, some more detailed, uh, you know, how, how the city adopted these changes. In general, all cities need to start thinking about how are projects now that they've, such as Petaluma has adopted um, this policy to encourage reducing vehicle miles traveled, how does, how are the other codes um, aligned with this? And I, I think of, you know, parking codes, density restrictions, height restrictions, um, you know, sometimes you might end up with a parking, a climate friendly project, project that doesn't meet the local codes. And then you might have a code compliant project that doesn't meet greenhouse gas, the, you know, the, the vehicle miles travel code. And so the, many cities are struggling through this right now, kind of going through and seeing how they can make align their uh, policies with um, their climate goals. Next slide. And so how will this change individual projects? Well, just pulling some of those measures that I mentioned earlier, um, it's gonna require that projects get denser, that you have a mix of land uses. When we say a diversity of land uses, we're talking about um, having retail easily walkable to residential or office spaces and having, you know, just a mix of land uses, um, you know, it, supporting micro mobility, having bike share stations built in, potentially subsidizing transit passes, um, not, you know, forgetting about just be best practices, making sure you provide bike parking. Um, and then I put uh, reducing parking supply and unbundled parking kind of in between them. This is a, a interesting one because when we think of a an unconstrained environment, parking environment, such as where you can, if you can't park um, on site, you generally in a suburban location, you can park somewhere on the street nearby. There's no parking costs for parking on street. Um, there's no kind of restrictions for parking on street elsewhere. There's, you know, there's plenty of available parking. Um, there's no real evidence that reducing parking on site would actually reduce your VMT. Um, how, and so that's, you know, puts Petaluma in the position where if you do, you know, the city is going to have to start to consider ways to, if you do want to achieve vehicle miles traveled reductions, you have to um, kind of mimic a more constrained, uh, a slightly more urban environment where parking is not easily and plentiful accessible everywhere. Next slide. And then finally, some projects are not going to be able to mitigate all their VMT on site. And so how, you know, there are opportunities to start to connect, um, you know, through uh, offsetting that VMT through paying for such as like increasing transit service and frequency, um, uh, closing sidewalk gaps, building active network tr transportation networks. Some of these things, especially 
if you're looking at projects that are in least, uh, you know, less accessible to walking and biking locations, um, putting uh, measures in place, such as improving the biking and walking conditions in a downtown or a denser environment might have a bigger effect on BMT. So that could be done right now. It's being done at a project by project level. Eventually there could be a VMT based transportation impact fee. Um, and then there's other alternate funding structures as well that are out there. And now I'll hand it back to Olivia. Great, thank you, Matt, for that run through. Um, I am going to now talk about what the city's process was in getting into alignment with uh, SB 743. And um, the city started a conversation in, way back in 2018 um, with a, a joint workshop between the Planning Commission and Council that really started the discussion about BMT in the city. And then we really ramped up in 2020 uh, and got things rolling when the uh, Council and Committees and Commissions appointed members and the Vehicle Miles Travel Technical Advisory Committee was formed with the role of providing input and recommendations to help develop those guidelines. Uh, and the TAC convened over three meetings to provide input and shape those guidelines and dig into the key components. And, uh, and then in March, provided a recommendation to Planning Commission and uh, Planning Commission forwarded that to council and they were adopted on June 21st of this year. So we now have adopted local BMT guidelines. And uh, you can see the link here at the bottom of the page is where the city has maintained a website showing all of the information, some of the history, links to all of those meetings and all of the resources are there as well. You can also uh, find the final guidelines on that page. And uh, those you'll note, there are earlier versions of the draft out there as they were being discussed and circulated. So if you are interested in the final, just make sure that you find the one that says final and the date is July, 2021. So um, the guidelines are really important to remember that the, these apply exclusively to new development projects that are undergoing environmental review. These are um, projects that are, are subject to discretion and have, um, entitlement actions that are needed to be made and have a CEQA document uh, in accordance with the California Environmental Quality Act. So uh, the guidelines do not begin to shape or form um, or, or otherwise affect existing BMT. These again apply exclusively to new development projects. So what the guidelines are is that it's essentially a protocol. It establishes uh, how to conduct a BMT analysis. They identify the base model to be relied upon, which is the latest uh, Sonoma County Transportation Authority model. And it establishes BMT as the metric and identifies methodology so that all BMT analysis are comparable. So one of the important things in the guidelines are the screening and the criteria that allows you to screen out of requiring a BMT analysis. And these are for intended to be for projects that are understood not to have a BMT impact based on the size, location within a BMT, a low BMT area, or are located within a high priority transit corridor, such as the downtown uh, smart station. They also specify any, um, what would, prevent you from using screening, like a drive-through function, for example, that uh, if you have a drive-through, you cannot screen out just de facto. Uh, and then also city staff uh, is, retains discretion to deny the use of screening for projects. So this uh, shows the BMT screening map for residential projects. The green here is where new residential development in the city could uh, screen out and would not be subject to a BMT analysis as long as it matches the city requirements, such as not exceeding the parking standard and meeting the uh, floor area ratio. And then the yellow areas are areas that are going to be subject to a VMT analysis with the lighter colors um, in areas that mitigation uh, may be able to achieve reductions to fall below thresholds and the darker color is where it would be much more difficult to achieve those reductions, uh, but mitigation would still be required. So the guidelines importantly establish thresholds for uh, CEQA purposes to inform what level of BMT generated by a project would be considered to have a significant environmental impact. In order to fall below the level of significance, retail would need to have a net zero um, 
it has a net zero threshold and residential would need to achieve a reduction of 16.8 below the per capita citywide average and office uses would need to achieve a reduction of 16.8% below the nine county bay area regional average. And if any of those um, levels are exceeded, then impacts for CEQA purposes are considered potentially significant and require mitigation. So the guidelines also identify um, mitigation that could be used for uh, reducing impact. Those are um, the, the effective uh, reductions come from really increasing de density or diversity of land uses. Of course, not all zoning or land uses allow for higher density or a mix of uses. Uh, accessibility, connectivity, and improvements to transit, bike, and pedestrian are all excellent BMT reduction strategies that can be employed at the project level. And telecommuting is also a very effective BMT strategy. I would uh, be so bold to suggest that this meeting tonight is a zero BMT event. We, none of us uh, drove to get here, and so here we are uh, successfully not contributing to BMTs. Um, another way is to uh, minimize parking, as Matt mentioned before, that can be really effective to dis ju just to get at discouraging vehicles through design. And then uh, micro mobility share programs and car share programs are also excellent um, BMT mitigation options. So I do want to mention that the city has not yet established a BMT reduction program um, that projects could contribute two, that is kind of a next step that is being investigated. And until such time as a program is developed, projects that exceed the threshold must mitigate on a case by case basis. So just to quickly recap on uh, coming into compliance with the SB 743, we are no longer concerned about level of service for CEQA purposes. And instead, we are relying on the BMT metric. This shift really promotes that active transportation and aligns local uh, policies with the state greenhouse gas reduction goals and it encourages infill development. Um, the, it also resulted in, SB 743 also resulted in the addition of a new CEQA guidelines section, which is where we're prompted to address transportation under BMT. And that went into effect on July 20th, uh, July 1st, 2020 at and at that time, all um, projects are required to use BMT thresholds and metrics. The city of Petaluma has been presenting BMT metrics since uh, 2019 in CEQA documents and analysis. And at that time, uh, because it predated the adoption of local guidelines, the reliance there was on the thresholds recommended by the Office of Planning and Research at 15% uh, below the citywide average. So uh, projects that were in process or deemed complete prior to council's action um, recently in 2021 here that adopted that 16.8 threshold are, are held to the 15% threshold still. So you'll continue to see projects that are in the pipeline that have been there that are locked in at that 15% level. But moving forward, all new development applications or those deemed complete after that, um, that new regulation that council adopted went into effect with our BMT guidelines, those are gonna be held to the 16.8% reduction. So I thought it would be um, helpful to talk through two project examples. Uh, one of these screened out from a BMT analysis, the River Bend project because of its location within a half mile of SMART. And the other one, uh, the Casa Grande, example was in one of those um, darker colored yellow areas and did not screen out and that required a BMT uh, analysis. So River Bend, even though it screened out, it still resulted in bike and pedestrian improvements and in facilities, including a, a section of Lynch Creek Trail. It also introduced uh, bike and ped amenities, including a water refill station and bike repair, as well as bike racks and frontage improvements, as well as curb bowl bouts and crosswalks um, at frontage streets, as well as street trees. So all of these things help to enhance the pedestrian realm. And um, I think it's important to point out that even though that didn't come through BMT mitigation because it is by virtue and alignment with the uh, bike and pedestrian plan that those were realized as part of the project. Um, and then on the other side of the coin, the Casa Grande project, uh, that one was subject to a BMT analysis and mitigation was necessary. 
there was, uh, they were able to achieve the necessary reductions by introducing a higher density residential project, uh, integrating affordable housing units on site and including accessory dwelling units. It also um, provided an, uh, some pedestrian network enhancements some safe crossing of uh, Casa Grande over to the Casa Grande High School and a crosswalk and refuge so that um, it, it would feel safe for the pedestrian. And additionally, it also involved installing bus shelters and bus stops. So with those improvements, uh, they were able to demonstrate a BMT reduction below the threshold and with mitigation, they were found to be less than significant. So um, now I'm gonna shift the conversation away from BMT generated by new development and how that's regulated in SB 743 and talk about the actions that the city is taking and pursuing that directly and indirectly get at reducing existing BMT citywide. So one of the biggest ways to achieve a BMT reduction is by concentrating growth within a specified area that is um, preferably close to transit and a mix of uses. The city of Petaluma uh, does have a successful track record of, of doing that first through the designation of an urban limit line in the 80s and then through the establishment of the urban growth boundary in the 90s, uh, which does include the identified expansion areas that are shown in orange here. And this has kept our community contained within these limits for 30 years. And now as part of the general plan update process, we're, we're going to look at um, focused expansion in those areas uh, in key locations and uh, in, in if that should be pursued. So that'll be part of the conversation. But um, the big task before us, of course, is shifting our, our uses within the UGB so that we see fewer vehicle trips and more non-auto travel. So another major milestone that um, has, has come out recently of the city is the declaration of the climate emergency, which was adopted in uh, May of 2019. And the resolution really uh, aims to elevate climate issues to the highest priority. It makes a commitment to achieving carbon neutrality as quickly as possible. And it directed that a climate commission be established. So the Climate Action Commission has been formed and it meets monthly. The commission produced the climate emergency framework, which was adopted by city council in January of 2021. The framework really uh, guides the, the city's ongoing response to and discussion about the climate crisis and informs subsequent policies and implementation strategies. One of the main goals identified in the framework is to eliminate transportation emissions by reducing BMTs through active transportation, land use policy, increasing density, increasing public transit investment and encouraging, encouragement and support of non-combustion vehicles. So the framework also acknowledges that a paradigm shift is really needed to curb the fastest growing source of greenhouse gas emissions, which is the transportation uh, sector. So the, um, another thing that the city does on an annual basis is to work together with the community to identify what work matters most and uh, come up with a list of goals and prioritized action items to be identified in, in the work plan. So there are a number of things in the current work plan that get at BMT. One of them is the adoption of a BMT policy. Um, others that relate to BMT include implementing alternative, clean, safe, accessible, affordable, and active public transportation modes, establishing and improving paths as useful transportation options, implementing a community bike share and identifying parking and transportation alternatives for downtown. So we're already kind of making this shift by what we're prioritizing in the community. And then of course, um, what is in process right now is the general plan update. And this is really has a, a lot of potential to reduce VMT citywide by design through revisiting the land use map and the transportation element with a focus on minimizing VMT. And importantly, it also includes a climate action adap and adaptation plan, which will chart the course for realizing greenhouse gas reductions. Um, and a major piece of that will be focused on transportation and minimizing BMT and shifting local trips to active modes and regional trips to public transit, rideshare, and away from the single occupancy vehicle. Uh, so it is 
I have a lot of hope that our, our general plan is going to make great strides in minimizing BMT citywide by concentrating growth in areas that are accessible to transit, by expanding opportunities to allow a mix of uses, and prioritizing pedestrian, bicycle, and supporting infrastructure over that of cars. And as we've discussed, historically, the development pattern and regulations has given priority to vehicles, but that is no longer the case. This change in approach is established in the state regulations that we've discussed and also in the local guidance, including the Petaluma's vehicle miles traveled um, implementation guidelines, the climate framework that I mentioned, as well as the goal and priorities, and will also be a theme of the general plan update. So um, I hope that kind of provides a nice high level view of the work in progress and what's on the horizon that start to tackle BMT citywide. I am going to shift now and um, ask that our city transportation engineer, Ken, uh, share with us what activities Public Works is advancing that also start to move the needle on citywide BMT reduction. Okay, Hi, thank, thank, yeah. thank you very much, Olivia. So um, I'm going to give you a little, you know, sort of a, a short version of some of the active transportation projects that we're doing in the city. And I want to, before we get into the slide deck, I mean, a key part of the data that I'm sure you all know is, you know, roughly 30% of our trips are less than two miles. And that's just a, it's, we have a wonderful bit of infrastructure that we can, you know, redo to help to get people walking and biking um, without having to get into their car. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I'm gonna talk about some of the, the, the current projects. Um, you know, the, the road diet um, or four to three lanes, also complete streets. Those are, um, we've got a couple of different projects that are moving that forward. The Petaluma Boulevard South Road Diet, which I have some exciting news on, I'll share. Our pavement preservation work, that's just getting going. And we've got a, a lot of that to do, which gives some great opportunity for active transportation. And then I'll finish up with some Lynch Creek and, and um, Prince Park um, uh, examples of what we've done on that. Uh, next, please. So, you know, Complete Streets is, it's been around a while. It was a deputy director of 64 from Caltrans and um, that first came out in 2008 and then was updated in 2014. And that's really where we, we look at, you know, let's, let's see what opportunities there are for, you know, bike lanes, um, buffered bike lanes, um, you know, more accessible surfaces for um, everybody, um, you know, mobility impaired. Um, it's, it's really important looking at transit improvements that we can make, um, the connectivity, you know, intelligent signals, uh, traffic cameras, we have that right now on Snow and Mountain Parkway, and it's really helping to reduce congestion, widen our sidewalks and narrow our roadways. So next, please. Um, you know, one one item that you know we're looking at right now and putting together, um, you know, design guidelines for the city is just what can we do within the right of way we have. And there's certain constraints just from the design guidance, the highway design manual that you know we're we're obligated to follow. Um, but we can find ways when we get you know roadway widths face a curb to face a curb greater than 46 feet, we have opportunities to be able to you know, look at, um, you know, shared, possibly shared bike lanes, um, or I should say buffered bike lanes, um, improve our intersections. Um, so that's something that, you know, we're going to, we're, we're going to be doing more and more on, and we have started already. So next, please. So some people say road diet, that usually brings people are concerned. If you say diet, that doesn't sound great. So what about um, you know, a four to three conversion. And what does that do? One of the things that um, I'm noticing with the, the data, the vehicular data, speed, speed data, as well as crash data is that we've got our roadways, um, people are going fast. They're going over the speed limit and um, that's a challenge. But as soon as you go from a four to three, 
you know, you can, you can reduce the traffic speeds and you get a crash reduction. And this is a very, you know, well-known um, you know, evidence of, of what has worked. If you go to Santa Rosa, this configuration has been put in Summerfield Avenue, Montgomery Drive, Wailupa, uh, Hohen Avenue, and they're just looking at 4th Street going into downtown right now. And um, there's a lot of good work that they've done up there. City of Alameda has done some on Otis Drive, and they're looking at Lincoln Avenue, you know, running uh, roughly three miles uh, in Alameda. So this is something that we want to do more, and it's going to have a very positive effect, you know, again, for reducing speeds and, and crashes. And then it, it just, it'll make it a more comfortable experience for pedestrians um, where they have to cross lanes. They won't have to necessarily cross four traffic lanes. Maybe they're, if they only have to cross two, you know, through lanes and a turn lane, that's going to make it, it's going to make it easier for them to navigate. Um, so um, we shorten the crossing distances. It simplifies the roadway. Emergency vehicles can, can still get through. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So Petaluma Boulevard, uh, the news here is that it's out to bid, um, which I'm very excited about. You know, we have, I feel that one of the challenges that, that Petaluma has overall is we, you know, our entrances go from basically rural highways, you know, into, into neighborhood roadways, whether you're on I Street coming into town, Bodega Avenue, D Street, Petaluma Boulevard, you know, helping to develop the context that, okay, you've been, you've been on a rural road, you've been on a highway, now you're coming into Petaluma. And how do you, how do you, you know, emphasize that, get people to slow down? And Petaluma Boulevard is, is this, um, South Petaluma Boulevard, I think is going to be a, a really good project to show what we can do. So next, please. Oh, and I, on Petaluma Boulevard, I should mention it's a four to three conversion. So we're going from four traffic lanes to three. So now I want to talk a little bit about the pavement preservation work that we've got going on. So we're trying to, you know, preserve the existing pavement that we have that we can preserve that has what's referred to as PCI pavement condition index. And so you know, we go through every two years and um, go through a inspection. It's all per ASTM um, uh, standards and, and go through every road and look at what the PCI is. And what we're trying to do is strategically save those streets that we can save with the limited monies that we have. And we have $120 million of deferred maintenance. And we're going to be putting in Currently, I've got a, a roughly $2 million contract that's, that's uh, moving forward to um, help preserve the pavement. But I wanna stress that the, the, this approach to pavement management, it, it does look at the sustainability of doing this. Um, so we wanna you know, maintain and preserve existing good pavement that we have. There's opportunities to use recycled materials for you know, rehabilitation, reconstruction. We did that on Sonoma Mountain Parkway. We're looking at it on North McDowell. Um, reduced use of virgin materials um, in, in the binder and aggregate uh, materials. Reduce the need for all materials. And then take advantage of the active transportation opportunities. So if, we, if we've got to go through and essentially redo the roadway, you know, paint it, uh, repaint it, you can think of, we can, we can adjust all the markings, we can adjust the striping, the markings that are on that road. And that's what we, you know, we're going to be, um, you know, striving to do. So next, please. So two examples of things that we can do at intersections, because these are some of the areas that have the highest crash incidents. Um, on the left side here is, is Eli and Caulfield, and this was completed at a relatively low cost. There wasn't a direct pavement preservation work that went on here, but the, the crash data showed that something needed to be done. And I want to give you know, accolades to, to the city engineer, Jeff Stutzman, for this work in particular. Um, so we're, we're helping to 
in doing bulb outs at the curb returns, you know, we're helping the pedestrian have a little bit more visibility and presence. We're moving the stop sign out so it has more visibility and presence. Um, we're shortening the crossing distance. So, you know, we're, we can walk anywhere from two to four feet a second. If we can, you know, move our, our curb line, even if it's in paint and we've got, you know, some vertical stanchions there, we move that out, we shorten that crossing distance 15, 20 feet, it's gonna reduce the delay. It's gonna reduce the time that vehicles have to stay there. So there's a, there's a benefit in reducing delay with that, that type of configuration. Um, it's, there's just, you know, getting more paint on the road is something that can, that can just give more presence to the, the condition. On the right side um, is Rainier Avenue and Maria, and we're going through a, a public process on that. And um, Maria is, is well due for uh, pavement preservation, but you know the city wants to do it right. I want to do it right and put in the right road markings that are going to help with that. And this this particular intersection can definitely, you know, use some help on it. So that that's a, a project that right now is in in process you'll be hearing more about next please so you know the 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 sort and the 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 jewels of active transportation sort of in my book of of you know petaluma is that we have um lynch creek trail you know we've got um washington creek trail we've got adobe creek um we've got corona creek we've got these these various uh, trails that sort of follow drainages and they cross at, at various points the the north south multi use path um, that primarily par parallels smart the smart tracks let's make use of those and get people you know moving from the neighborhoods on those into into the downtown area so um, with that um, um, that's thank you very much Thank you, Ken, for sharing those uh, exciting developments. I am now going to invite our transit ma manager, Jared Hall, to uh, share his screen and, um, and share with us how transit is uh, evolving to think about uh, BMT and, and what is happening on that front. Thank you uh, very much, Olivia. Good evening, everyone. Sorry, you're treated as second dose of me in a little over a month. Um, I'll make it fairly brief. So I'm sure people are very excited to have a little more uh, discussion and Q&A on this. Um, so let me maximize this here. So we uh, covered a lot of ground tonight. Um, I wanted to give a bit of an overview from the transit standpoint to see how we're going to be impacted and what our role is in this kind of um, new uh, future going forward, which is really exciting from our standpoint. And so as a reminder, and here's something you may have seen before, I think it's good to have some historical context on kind of how Petaluma is currently set up, how it's been set up in the past and the fact that we may be looking at kind of a somewhat a transition point now going forward to kind of contrast with. Historically, a lot of the development in Petaluma, it's been automobile centric street design. So you have a focus on roads and lane miles to improve your mobility options. There's been a focus on vehicle level service, which is something that is mostly about the efficiency of movement of automobiles not necessarily the efficiency of movement of people. And so those are two very much different things. Um, more bike facilities and road diets have been used in recent years, as Ken alluded to, uh, which is great news. And hopefully that'll be the case in the future. But I think we all know there's a long way to go to improve a lot of those areas and make more multimodal corridors going forward. And so we heard about the uh, bike and transit mode shares throughout Petaluma, something that will hopefully continue as part of this effort going forward. And then we're hoping to see more usage of transit oriented development. An important piece that Olivia touched on is um, I think it's important to make sure that the transit and the development overlap well in the future so that you see a lot of those pockets coming in where there's good transit service already that will hopefully be improved even more in the future going forward. Another piece is your first and final mile connections going to and from hubs to your residence, to your place of employment. 
And then uh, there's some kind of elements that are unique to Petaluma, things like the Petaluma River, which bisects it, which is great in some ways, and others can make it uh, more difficult from a connection standpoint, you know, whether it's bike pad, transit, or any mode of transportation. And then some of the Western Petaluma topography and street grids. Uh, many of the elements there are great for walking, but when you have kind of a disjointed um, grid, it can make it hard to provide transit. Or in East Petaluma, when you have some of the suburban type land use developments, uh, that also can make it tricky to serve with transit as well. So in terms of kind of that transition that you're looking at, um, really, again, what we, I just mentioned a second ago, we've heard tonight, the LOS is something that's been the traditional me measure that's, you know, looked at in kind of the traffic engineering side um, in terms of the impact of a project, but it's very much looking at the movement of vehicles, regardless of how many people are in those, and if people are knowledgeable with it without getting too technical, it's a grading system, you know, to where, of course, everyone wants an A for their grade, no one wants an F, but if a lot of people saw what LOS A looks like, you would have, you know, nice wide highways going through your city, so I don't think that's really what people want, but that's something to where that's often been the um, kind of analysis of a project coming in is what are the impacts of level of service that it brings? Is it worsening that as in making vehicles run slower? Well, that works well in some regards in terms of the vehicle mobility. It doesn't always work well in terms of the person mobility, making things more walkable, bikeable, making it transit friendly. And so that is really kind of the big shift that we're seeing here is it's putting more of a focus on the personal mobility side, which I think will be great going forward. Um, one of the things that you'll see is um, hopefully means better correlation between transportation and land use based policy decisions. Again, making sure those areas coincide well going forward. It means we're able to provide more transportation options, not only um, are you just gonna have the single occupant vehicle type uses available to get point to point? You'll also be able to get places better with transit with bike and pedestrian. Right now there's pockets of the city where you can't reach them very well using those modes, if at all. And so hopefully that'll improve over time. It helps to maximize the efficiency of the existing transit that we have out there on the street now. There's always a balance of transit, as you probably heard me mention of kind of the coverage, the geographic side of things. Oh, gee, we need a bus that serves this part of the city or business park or things like that to where you're making sure they have access, even if it's not always going to be the most productive system, given kind of the design and the land uses. But as things infill, as you're getting more transit oriented developments, you A, are leveraging the existing transit that serves it nearby. And so you're getting more riders on the service that you have there. And it also allows you to put more service on those corridors so that it's sustainable. So it's always kind of the chicken and the egg of development and transit service. You always have to think of that going forward is what is the right time frame for both so you can both scale them up appropriately and you have the transit service needed for any new or modified developments coming in. And then it helps to change the thinking of pedestrian oriented development in terms of building and land uses. You know, you may not have, for example, the development with a huge sheet of parking um, close to the sidewalk with a building set way back, as you see in many um, places, you know, throughout the country, you definitely can think of a few in Petaluma, I'm sure as you've heard us talk about before, as you get things more like transit oriented development, it's not just a look of the building, um, it's things like the setback of the building, you know, if it's right near your transit hub, if it's right near the sidewalk, all of a sudden it's subconsciously much more inviting to want to walk to that place, to bike to the place. And all of these are things that are just kind of directly or tangentially related to the shifts that I think our benefits can bring as you start looking at DMT more with this change. And so in terms of some of the projects that we are doing and that we will be doing soon, here's some of the ones that you'll see in the, um, that you've seen over recent time. And ironically, Ken and I just got off a meeting prior to this one, that's the reason we're a few minutes late, where we were talking about uh, the bike share system with the subcommittee of our transit and um, PBAC committees. And so we're excited about that because we were talking about the bike share hubs tonight. Uh, we ran through the seven proposed locations. And so that's something to where the city council last month approved the operator agreement for bike share. We're looking at the locations right now to finalize those and something to where they'll be approaching the city soon 
with the proposed locations to get that started. That would be the first such kind of program in Petaluma, our first real instance of organized microtransit, uh, which could be things like more bike share, scooters, um, even smaller vehicles going forward. And so we're very excited to see how the program goes. If it's successful, which I hope it will be, there can be expansion of this or other kind of microtransit options going forward. Um, additional transit service has been added in recent years with grant funds that we have. Of course, transit service is one of the big ways to reduce VMT, as you know, as we've seen tonight. So that's come in the form of extra late night service and weekend transit service. Um, and we have a list of additional um, transit enhancements we can make, whether they're on existing routes, providing more service, running later into the night, or um, different routes, new routes, things along those lines. Bus stop improvements and fixtures are another one. We've uh, recently updated our bus stop inventory. We have a list that we're updating right now of our prioritized bus stop locations that as funding comes in, we can relatively quickly do improvements there to add new shelters, new benches, real-time signs. And that's one of the elements that kind of strengthens your transit network and gets more riders out there, again, leveraging the service that is already out there on the road now. More trip training and outreach events, more transit signal prioritization. So the buses are able to have shorter trip times as they get through intersections a bit faster. That's a system that we currently have running on um, our buses right now that we could expand more in the future. And then it can be past programs like the Clipper Start means-based fare program that's been running um, a little less than a year that gives you a 20% discount on our transit if you apply for that in our low income. Some additional ones we could do in the future, and you has heard me touch on a few of these bus stop improvements, real-time transit signs, more service, increased frequency on major corridors and transit routes, transit-oriented infrastructure that could be things like bus queue jumps, uh, maybe bus-only facilities or lanes, something that you see other places throughout the region that we don't have now that I think become increasingly viable as we build out our transit network, as we get more TODs coming in. It's a kind of thing that really makes transit more competitive with single occupant vehicle trips. And that is really when you start getting more people on transit is when it's uh, convenient overall. Convenient in the sense that the trip times are comparable. Convenient in the sense you can go out there and catch a bus without having a paper schedule, knowing with good confidence it'll be there within 10 minutes or so. Uh, fleet and facility electrification. Some of these touch a bit on greenhouse gas more than DMT but they very much go hand in hand as I'll talk about in a second, but that is one of the big elements um, that we're looking at going forward. Transit pass programs, there's a lot of other options that we've been looking at where, you know, as we have the resources to roll out more of these programs going forward, uh, we can do things like the Veterans Fair Program, reduced youth fares or other pilot programs, shuttles and microtransit pilot programs, and then uh, additional transportation demand management. Really, all these things are kind of a piece of the puzzle. If you're gonna address this well and reduce BMT, all of these things come to play. It's the land use side, it's the transit side, it's a lot of the programmatic and educational pieces that you get with transportation man management. Here's some of the um, eye candy, if you wanna see some of the vision of what we could potentially see in Petaluma going forward. Top left, you see, um, of course we have bike only lanes, but we don't really have any bus only lanes in Petaluma yet, you can see those. You can see a nice new transit, um, hub on the top right there. You can see electric buses. We're getting ready to start the first round of our electric bus procurements. Uh, we're working on it right now. That's exciting. And then you can see kind of a futuristic concept uh, that's actually in Germany right there, which is a mobility hub, which is hopefully something we'll see more. In that case, it is a bus station. You can see bike share in there. I think there may be subway underground and there's little um, kind of private uh, car share cars you can rent as well, and even a nice bike lane running right nearby. Other considerations. Um, so overall, you have to kind of think of this all holistically, as I mentioned. So the transit elements come into play in several regards with several ongoing efforts, you know, that we're touching on tonight. Things like the general plan, the active transportation plan, the short range transit plan are all um, being updated now or will be in the very near future. It's a lot of the policies within the decision, things like how are you making it easier to promote transit-oriented development? 
make uh, bike bed improvements, you know, in terms of your funding allocations and things along those lines. Parking is a big piece. Um, frankly, it's very difficult to have transit and have it work well if you have large swaths of ready available free parking. So that's one of the considerations to look at, whether it's a cost element or how it's managed. Uh, talk a little about the development land use patterns and proximity of the transit along corridors. Transportation man management is a big piece of that. And then um, I think the VMT is a big piece of it, but I think it's very important to think of it holistically. A good example is with the uh, fleet electrification. That may not reduce VMT much, if at all. I don't know if you necessarily get more people out there riding the bus just because it's now less emissions instead of diesel, somewhat, but it's a huge gain with greenhouse gas reduction on one of the biggest fleets throughout the city. And so the task, you know, we're kind of looking at is how you best achieve the BMT reduction. But I do think it's important to think big picture, make sure it ties in with other city goals. So you're doing them all consecutively, such as greenhouse gas reduction, increased social equity, access to jobs and service, you know, where are these uh, new routes running to and from, and then public health being a big piece of it too. And so uh, that is it for me. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jared. That was uh, fantastic. So I, I think you've heard tonight that we are in a new era of how we regulate and think about transportation with an eye on reducing emissions through electrification and minimizing BMT by prioritizing bike and pedestrian and transit modes over over roads that are designed for the car. And we have our work cut out for us to upgrade infrastructure and promote the use of bikes for travel and to make walking more desirable and transit more accessible. And we get there by uh, overlapping all of these policies, by um, setting regulation, by setting the intent. And we now have guidelines in place that mandate impacts be evaluated using the BMT metric. We have the declared climate emergency and the framework to orient all decisions back towards climate resiliency. And we have the general plan update and process and among the uh, numerous other activities that you have heard mentioned here this evening. And we get there by building out the bike impediment infrastructure and transit infrastructure. So moving forward, the city has a choice to make and where to invest and what to fund to support a shift away from cars. And the community has a choice to make. Every time you grab your keys, pause and consider if the trip can be made by bike or bus or smart. And instead, grab your walking shoes, grab your bike helmet or your bus pass and get out there and be part of the solution. So that completes our, our presentation tonight. I'm gonna to hand it back to uh, Dave and Dan and we're, we're happy to engage in a discussion. Thank you so much. Oh, have we got questions. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, they, I, I think we've lost one of the people who was asking why I care about VMT, um, but um, that's, be, I, I just wanted to toss out that beyond greenhouse gas emissions, that the only real cost that people pay for all of the subsidies for the personal automobile is time spent in traffic. And so the we build wider and wider roads and people use that up. And so that's why, that's one of the reasons, many reasons why VMT. But one of the questions we got from several people was what are the models used to evaluate what the vehicle miles traveled will be for new developments and how are those going to be tested and what's the feedback mechanism for looking at, uh, did that actually reduce VMT or not? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So I mentioned um, we have the Sonoma County Transportation Authority model and that really sets the the framework within which we um, analyze uh, uh, trips and how we can look at that. Um, I would like to ask Matt to jump in and, and talk a little bit about the inner workings of that model and, and uh, expand on what I just said. <laughs> I'm not gonna go into all the inner workings, but yeah, as Olivia mentioned, Sonoma County Transportation Authority maintains a countywide travel model that is calibrated to 2019 conditions. And so it does account for things like SMART and it does account for you know, bike, bikeway networks and that sort of thing. So, and they have a future year 2040 model as well. And so that's that's the basic information. That's your standard, what all cities um, across the state are relying on are these travel models. Now they need to continue to get better because they, they were designed for 
forecasting traffic volumes in an era of level service. And you know, I think all 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 counties are working actively to to try to you know make continue to refine them and make them more attuned um, so that they we can do do more accurate planning on reducing VMT. Um, another aspect is uh, as I mentioned uh, the. CAPCOA, California Air Pollution Control Officers, created that guidelines um, that takes gathers all the latest and greatest research about the effectiveness of rolling out bike share or improving transit service or dense, increasing density, all that stuff. So Sonoma County actually uh, just got an, is just approved, and Petaluma is a part of this in funding this, uh, a tool that will allow each city to calculate the, the VMT reductions associated with um, the different measures. So everything is done consistently. So that's just another forecasting tool. Now, your question about how do we know how well we're doing, that is definitely the trickier piece. And, you know, no, I wouldn't say, um, you know, cities, the few cities that have mechanisms to do that are places like San Francisco that have set mode share goals, you know, long-term mode share goals to, you know, achieve greater low carbon um, transportation modes. Um, and, uh, you know, the city of Petaluma is, is, that's something certainly to think about is like how, how as a part of the general plan, should it continue to monitor and make sure that VMT is being reduced and that mode share to lower carbon modes is, is happening. Yeah, and just um, a couple of quick thoughts yeah. too. I think it's a lot of data sources, you know, it's looking with the regional ones, like working with our partners at SETA. And then I think it's some local ones, you know, different data sources like traffic counts, not just counts for vehicles for uh, you can do counts for bike facilities to see how those are going. And then if you get into some more specific items, possibly some TDM items, in many cases, it can even be more specific down to the business or the program to look at those specifically to see what the impacts are, maybe doing surveys. So a part of this, I would say going forward is kind of an admin function is to make sure you're doing these things, doing them well and they're effective you need to kind of um, look at the data pretty regularly and do a bit of analysis there to see what's working and what isn't. Yeah, there can be a big administrative function <laughs> that some cities take on. And, you know, a, a lot of peninsula cities, I would uh, just caution, you know, the group as to recognize that it can be pretty challenging. A lot of peninsula cities were the first to really move on transportation demand management programs. And a lot of them have struggled um, to keep up with just managing, uh, understanding how all the different companies, big tech companies are doing on the metrics that they've set for them. So it's something certainly that Petaluma should consider, but also, you know, recognize uh, sometimes you have to set, set, set higher level goals. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm going to read this one from Dave directly because I think it kind of drills down into some of these model questions. If I recall correctly, OPR directs that mixed use VMT be assessed based on the dominant use. But what if a project has roughly equal traffic generation from residential office and retail? So it actually does say that individual land uses should be evaluated. I think you know the dominant land use is certainly present when you're talking about um, a pro like an office project or a residential project with say 10,000, 20,000 square feet of retail, you know, that's meant to be more lo locally serving. So for a mixed use project, uh, the Petaluma guidelines are that, um, you know, if there's a hundred, hundred residential units and 200,000 square feet of office space, like each of those needs to be evaluated for significant impacts separately acknowledging that they may have some effect of there's maybe some internalization of trips just by creating a mixed use project. Okay. Retail generally has the best best benefit in that that respect. Two questions about uh, specific streets in pedal. Well, actually, we've got a number about specific streets, but I'm not sure I can keep up with all of them and I don't want to be here all night. Um, does the Rainier Road diet have a VMT benefit and can it be calculated? And yeah, what and then any perspectives on reducing the VMT for the South McDowell extension business loop? 
Um, so yes, we are going to start um, calculating some of these reductions. Um, absolutely, that is really important so that we know what benefit we're getting. Um, and as Matt mentioned, we can use that CAPCOA uh, guidance to estimate those reductions. Uh, so that is something that we will be looking at moving forward. I am not aware that that calculation has been done to date, um, but absolutely as we move forward, that will be a really important piece that we'll start to want to share um, on these types of projects, including the Petaluma Boulevard South. Um, one for Jared and, and, well, two for Jared actually, and one of them is related to my neighborhood where I see kids on bikes riding to Grand Elementary menaced by cars and boy, every kid we can get on a bike in that neighborhood is good, um, or out of a car toward Grant. Uh, how do we size buses? It seems like we've got a lot of huge buses running around that um, may be hauling a lot of steel for relatively few passengers. And then uh, any plans to have school buses? Yeah, sure. Um, so maybe the second one first, the school buses. So Petaluma City Schools does provide some school bus service. Per my understanding, they actually provided more prior to the 2008 recession. And then a number of those um, services were reduced and Petaluma Transit actually stepped in at that point and started providing a number of school tripper services of which we run uh, six right now. We have ones that serve the uh, major middle schools and high schools, uh, one that actually goes by Grant Elementary, for example. Um, so those are currently running right now. So it's some combination of, um, you know, kind of Petaluma City Schools and ourselves looking at that. One of the great things of serving those areas is that so those are some of our um, highest productivity routes. So it's really great that we can serve those areas with Petaluma Transit because we're not just getting a lot of riders, but we're helping to build kind of that behavior of people when they're young of riding transit, of biking, which kind of serves them well throughout their lives, especially if they're going to be long-term Petaluma residents. So continuing to meet that need is something that we're going to look at going forward, uh, serving the areas that we're serving now better. If there's any areas we're not serving, um, serving them better in the future. In terms of the fleet, there's a lot of considerations that we look at and we're always considering right sizing the vehicles. What you're considering when you're looking at the vehicles is you're purchasing something that has a 15 year lifespan. So it's a pretty significant time that you're gonna have that vehicle and you always wanna size it right and you always wanna maintain good flexibility for yourself. Now, in many cases, you know, if people see a bus that's not full capacity, maybe in the middle of the day, uh, that's kind of how the trend line works. Usually the buses are at their fullest when it's rush hour, when people are often in the traffic, it's bumper to bumper and people don't often think to look in the bus when all those cars are on the road or often when people are in the buses. The problem is you have to design the system in a way somewhat that you're going to have the flexibility to provide all of those seats, all the demand without having to provide an additional vehicle. A good example is we use these buses for the butter and eggs parade, if people recall that, one of our biggest parades, and that's actually our busy, busiest transit day of the year. We provide free transit on that, and we have more service running, and even our 40-foot buses, our biggest ones, are full at that time. Or we also run the 40 foot buses on our school trippers, and those can be full, literally packed in, you know, with 50 or so um, kids, so you can't fit any more of them. And so it's kind of a balance, you know, of what is the right size vehicle going forward so that we're not having bigger vehicles that we need, more missions that we need, but we have the flexibility with our fleets to meet those kind of demands, demands for emergencies and evacuations, things along those lines. Uh, that's something that we're always looking at and kind of balancing overall with those and several other kind of considerations. Cool. Thank you. Uh, a number of questions about VMT mitigation bank rather than using offsetting VMTs and yeah. I... Yeah, I mean, there are places in California that are investigating VMT mitigation banks. Um, another version of it is an exchange. It's basically uh, where you would pay, you know, a developer would pay in. It's similar to a traffic impact fee, but a developer would pay into a program and then that program disperses money to 
um, build active transportation VMT reducing facilities. And so um, the concept of a, a mitigation bank or exchange is really exciting. It seems like it's going to be, it would be really challenging for a local jurisdiction to set it up and monitor it. Um, it seems like it would be best done at a regional or even potentially a sub-regional, Sonoma County, Marin County, potentially basis. And it's something that MTC is, is investigating and looking at. The challenge, of course, once you get down to the local level is um, you only have so many development projects coming through each year um, that are paying into it, you, and you need someone who's an expert monitor. Um, and the name bank actually means that there is basically a some sort of federally recognized bank that's taken care of it. And um, so the, you know, those sort of administration challenges mean that no local jurisdictions yet in the state of California are, are really looking into it. it's more of a, a county or regional level. But yes, it could be very effective at funding better regional strategies, which are very important for getting people around. Uh, two, two questions for Ken. Um, one is that uh, for, with more batteries and plastic in vehicles, e-cars, scooters, and bikes, how do we get the smart set signals to detect low metal vehicles? We uh, have a couple of instances of sensors that don't do a very good job with bikes. And while I'm asking questions for Ken, where was that? Oh yeah, uh, can we talk a little bit about how the various road diet improvements impact cycling safety? Because I know that a lot of cyclists aren't keen on things like ball bouts and such. So a little discussion there. Yeah. So, you know, with, with regard to the induction loops, um, referred to as type six Caltrans induction loops, you know, the city's moving away from that, um, you know, trigger for, for um, you know, the, at, at uh, signalized intersections and moving to cameras. It's just a much more, the cameras have gotten so much better, much more reliable. Um, and the city has a great system, you know, starting out. So there's going to be, it's a slow, you know, evolution moving away from, from induction loops to a, a um, you know, a camera based system. And um, we've started that. So, and then with regard to, you know, the, um, you know, using the ball bouts and, and how those are, are put in, you know, I, I come from more of a vehicular cycling background and, but it's really important to look at, you know, what are the kids doing? What are people that are, you know, maybe more comfortable recreational cyclists and don't, you know, aren't as comfortable, you know, being in the roadway. And so it's, it's a, a process that takes careful planning. You can't, you can't go in there and, and just, you've got different user groups that have to be considered. An example would be like the roundabouts, um, you know, going in and Petaluma Boulevard South. If you're not comfortable in taking a lane and going through the roundabout, you, you have an option to go in and, um, you know, use a, a kind of an off ramp and go through the crossing. Um, so, it's, it's going to be, you know, there's different user types and the infrastructure has to accommodate those different user types. And it does take, you know, careful, thoughtful planning and design. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm trying to keep up with all of these and I know I'm sorry, so many questions are going to get dropped on the floor here. Um, I, I, I'm not sure who this goes to, but uh, in terms of dealing with parking issues, are there uh, any notions of using shared e-car or other situations in particular uh, was referenced that there are some develop, uh, some low income developments that seem to have more, residents are parking on neighboring streets. And of course, you know, the obvious solution there is go to permit, uh, paid permit parking, free parking is, is a subsidy that's going to get used, but uh, vehicle shares and other things that can address that. Um, I, can, I can take first stab and, and car share is a proven way to reduce VMT because 
it allows people to feel more comfortable at going car free. And just, just that decision of being car free and knowing that you have that option to have a car to run, you know, to make your Costco run or to go up to the mountains um, is, you know, is, is extremely important. Um, and so, you know, pretty much any, it, you know, many new developments are putting them in there. There's an interesting, um, there's an interesting study that Transform led, which Transform is a advocacy, transportation and land use equity ag advocacy group in the East Bay, um, where they basically interviewed a bunch of low income uh, affordable housing developments, um, residents in, in the East Bay and found that ag car share was one of the most critical um, items for them, because especially when you're living in a low density, not transit accessible area, you know, bike share could help, but also car share could also really help, especially if it's, you know, priced in a way that, you know, subsidized in a way for those residents that they can afford to use it. So, um, yes. Okay, cool. Uh, Moira has her hand up and I think she wants to ask uh, some more detail about mitigation banks. Moira, go for it. Yeah, thanks. Can you guys hear me? We can. So um, good evening. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I have some real concerns. There are a couple of slides that were put up um, and they showed mitigation banks and exchanges in lieu of fees, impact fees, and that city staff retains the discretion to deny use of VMT screening uh, based on project location and VMT efficiency. Um, so theoretically, a developer then could purchase VMT reduction credits, and we would have really great difficulty verifying the legitimacy of the claimed VMT reductions. So my concern here is that developers have scored a home run. We now have no level of service that they have to comply with, and we effectively have no VMT they have to comply with. Um, I'm not sure how we're going to meet our climate change goals. We, we've declared a climate emergency. This all looks and sounds really good on paper, but we have Scannell and Amy's that has 330 off-street parking spaces literally down the street from our main transit center. And then we have David and single family homes that are possibly going to be um, approved out at Scott's Ranch. So I hear you and I don't see it. I don't see that you get that we have a serious emergency, Matt, who's doing this development for the city. I don't see this being taken seriously. I don't see any evidence with that kind of language, city staff retains discretion. Why does city staff retain discretion? It's the citizens of Petaluma that are impacted. Ramey and Associates has shown that every single census tract is is impacted adversely by traffic emissions why when it's the citizens who bear the impacts of this is it at the discretion of city staff i i mean i as a scientist as a scientist i'm really really frustrated and i just feel like the climate action framework is a joke and that we're not really prepared to do what we need to do but Let's let the staff weigh in. Um, okay, well, I hear your concern. I definitely want to provide some uh, clarification and correction because uh, staff has discretion. That call out that you heard is about VMT screening. So that is if a project comes forward and they are the developer is saying uh, we screen out because we're here, but they are a um, a use that wouldn't fit within that, then staff retains the discretion to say, no, absolutely not. You are subject to a VMT analysis. So that is the only place that staff discretion comes into play is elevating the screening. Um, so like all of our environmental review processes and project entitlements, um, staff will bring forward a recommendation and our decision makers are the ones who decide on whether or not the information is adequate, whether or not the project should be entitled. So um, that is kind of how the process works. And there's no difference with uh, the VMT analysis versus what we were traditionally doing under the level of service. Staff receives a, um, a traffic impact study or a VMT analysis, and we review that. We vet it to make sure that it is substantiated, that it follows the guidelines that we now have adopted, and then and and then we uh, present that information. Um, so that is sort of how how the process works in terms of the the VMT analysis and um, 
staff's role there. Thanks for that clarification. Uh, so, boy, we could go on all night and uh, it's getting close to 11.30 where I am. Um, let's see. Uh, if the city is successful in reducing VMT from existing development, uh, does that reduce the VMT thresholds that apply to newly proposed projects or are we going to really ratchet this down? Yeah, great question. So um, it's from the baseline every time. So as we move forward in time, if we get better, then that's reflected in our baseline, but new projects still have to meet that, um, that reduction level. And we have currently that 16.8% reduction level adopted, but that may change as we go through the general plan update process and as we periodically review and check in with where we want to be and where we're going as a city. So that is something that's kind of baked into the um, the model is that you're always looking at the baseline, whatever that is today, tomorrow, or next year. And do we know uh, what percent of the EMT we need to get to to meet the 2030 goals? Well, that is the million dollar question. So I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of things that weigh in on um, how BMT relates to, to greenhouse gases and what gets us there. Uh, I think it's important to recognize that you know, if we were to shift all of our um, fleet to all electric and drive around, we would meet our climate goal. We would have, you know, net, net zero emissions, but we would still have the same amount of BMT. So um, those two things are related, but they are, are you know, different. So uh, there's a lot of things that are happening at the state level and locally that we have fuel standards, we have, um, uh, car manufacturing standards. So these things get at reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but what we have to do locally, what we can do is to help shift that mode of transit so that we're getting people out of the cars, we're reducing the length of trips, we're giving people options so that they can make a choice and take, not take their car. Um, so that's, that's really what we want to focus on and, and what is the, the objective in the near term. Okay. Um, and then I, going aside from uh, VMT a little bit, we have a, a question about, and maybe this is actually just one to toss uh, on to the future, um, future, uh, you know, before you grow meetings, is how do we, um, how do we bring more design, more landscaping, more of that sort of thing into our redesign of our streets? How do we make beautiful streets? Um, and I think that's probably one for you know before you you know before you grow to do a future one and not in the VMT section. Yeah, I think that's true, but I think that um, it it gets at reducing VMTs when you introduce these great street trees that provide shade and people actually want to be in that sidewalk space because it's it feels nice and it's pleasant and it's shaded and you have a protective barrier so you're not walking immediately adjacent to a road. You have a landscape buffer that provides that separation between the travel lane and the bike lane and um, the pedestrian realm. So I think that is, is a very important piece about our design and um, how we can help to support that, that mode shift is by making it a pleasant experience. And on the city side, one process where that comes into play would be the update of some of the plans we talked about, like the general plan, active transportation plan, that's a good venue to have that discussion as well, hear those ideas and talk through it a bit more. I'm sorry, I'm being dragged multiple ways by back channel. Um, let's see, we got that one, we got that one. Uh, let's see, I think that can go. Uh, how can we create mobility hubs at our smart train stations, current and future? Yeah, I mean, I can take a first stab at that one. I think it's having several of those elements that we touched on today tied together. I think it's having it be accessible from a variety of different modes. So you have the train station there, you have the Copeland Transit Mall, you know, with all the transit agencies serving that nearby on the other side of the parcel. You need um, additional improvements to the bike and pedestrian infrastructure nearby to make sure there's no missing links. 
It's things like additional wayfinding signage, so it's easier to find your way around there. And then where the land use component comes in is the TODs. You know, right now you can't get very well from, you know, the smart station to the Copeland Transit Mall because there's a nice big fence right in the middle that you have to walk around. But when that's developed, you know, it'll Did you hear me, Darren? Or no? Hang yeah. on. It'll be additional uh, connections through there, whether that's, you know, um, bike, uh, pedestrian, transit, or any of those kind of things. So I think those are a lot of elements that come into play that are really how you build out more of those hubs. Even some things that we're getting now, we don't yet have like a bike share, some of those um, car share elements. The more you have the intersection of all of those elements or transportation man management combined, that's how you create effective mobility hubs to where you really reduce your VMT, do it well in a way that gives people options for transportation, gives them a sense of place to where they want to go there and they want to do so using um, active transportation or whatever. Cool. Um, aside from some notes about how there are other impacts to electric vehicles other than greenhouse gases, I think we've kind of gotten the high level of everything. And um, I think I, we can go back through the, uh, the chat log later and create follow-ups for future No Before You Grows. I don't wanna keep you all on here uh, all night because I know that an hour and a half is already a long session. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Olivia, do you have final thoughts? No, I just think it's um, fantastic that we're all having a chance to have this conversation. Uh, there's lots of opportunities to get involved with your ideas and input through the general plan update process. So um, be sure to participate where you can with surveys and input there. That's really important to help shape the vision um, and continue to participate in, in the, um, the VMT technical advisory committee is going to be reconvening here in, uh, in the future. And those will be opportunities again to uh, talk about uh, VMT reduction. So uh, that is all coming and, and you've heard all about the great projects and there's lots of ways, as you all know, to uh, be engaged and um, through the, the various committees, commissions. Um, so I look forward to uh, continuing this conversation and, and helping to realize that, that shift from, um, from uh, the car to the, the walkable, bikeable, pedestrian um, community. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Yes, thank you all for coming. Uh, we will have a, no, before you grow, we'll have the further discussion on the 28th in at Aquas Cafe at noon. And uh, we have lots more comments here in the chat, which I will uh, try to distill and pass around so that we can have further conversations. And, uh, I'll have the video up as soon as I can, but uh, internet here in Iowa is not gigabit fiber at home. So uh, have a have a great evening, y'all. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.